Hello, and welcome to the BYU Family History Library webinar series. We're glad you could join us today. I'm Olivia Tuller, and I'll be your host for this webinar. If you have technical difficulties during the webinar, please use the chat box and I can address your concerns. You are welcome to use the chat box during the webinar for comments, insights, and questions. However, all questions will be addressed at the end of the presentation. Our next webinar is on June 9th with Julie Stoddard. She will be giving a presentation entitled, Understanding DNA and Using DNA Test Results to Build Your Family Tree. If you would like to access a previous webinar, please visit our webinar index on our website or search on our YouTube channel. All of our webinars are recorded and uploaded by the following Monday for your convenience. We also post links to web recordings and other updates on our Facebook and Twitter accounts. For today's webinar, we are pleased to hear from James Tanner, who will be giving a presentation on what's new on my, myheritage.com. Before we begin, here is a little bit about James. James has over 39 years experience in genealogical research and is an avid blogger of Gene Genealogy Star blog and rejoice and be exceeding glad. He has served as a family history volunteer for 17 years and has presented at expos and conferences around the US, Canada, and Europe. He is a member of the board of directors of the Family History Guide Association and is currently serving at the BYU Family History Library. James is a professional photographer and has seven children, 34 grandchildren, and two great-grandchildren. If James is ready, we will turn the time over to him. Today, we're going to be talking about what's new on my heritage. And I really feel like whenever I start a, a presentation on my heritage, I need to tell people to prepare to be amazed. Um, one of the things that you may not know is that MyHeritage is by far the largest genealogical company, uh, company in Europe and in all of the other parts of the world. And I'll show you why that is the case in just a few minutes. But what we have uh, on MyHeritage are just some fabulous tools that will uh, uh, truly become uh, very important if you start using them because they are uh, extremely uh, innovative and new. And MyHeritage actually drives the technology for all of the genealogical community. Uh, they're the ones who have developed the, the fastest and the most uh, sophisticated tools. So uh, we'll get right into it and we'll talk a little bit about what they are and uh, who they are. And then a lot of things about uh, what they do on their uh, website. This is a summary of, uh, of my heritage. Um, if you look at that first number over there, you'll see uh, something that's, uh, that's phenomenal. They have over 101 million users worldwide. For, for comparison, Family Search's number is about 14 million. And we don't have any idea that the number of people who actually are associated with uh, Ancestry.com, but the numbers that they, re they release say they have about 3 million um, user, uh, registered users. So when you're talking about a company that uh, is worldwide and is represented in every single nation in the world, every country in the world has my heritage users and it is completely based on on being able to collaborate and contact people within the the my heritage program itself so uh, one of the features of the program is that they match you to uh, people who are anywhere in so you're basically when you go on and put your family tree on my heritage they immediately begin trying to uh, establish the pattern of your tree compared to the patterns of all the other 101 million people out there. And so then you begin to get what are called smart matches and you are very quickly given information about um, uh, people who have who share patterns. That's not just names, but patterns in the family tree. And they do that in 42 different languages. And every name on the family tree is translated into 
all of the different variations in 42 million in 42 different languages. So the searches, when you do a search on family search on, excuse me, on my heritage, you basically have uh, you're looking out there at uh, 42 different languages, and the information you can get would be from collectively from all of these 101 million people. They also have uh, over 17 billion historical records, and we'll talk a little bit more about the historical records in a second. And they have 5.8 million people in their DNA database and 86 million family trees on their, on their website. Uh, so these numbers probably don't, don't register usually for most people. So that you're really uh, in a situation where you may or may not appreciate uh, what this means. But if you start focusing on any given country of the world, and let's say your ancestors came from uh, Scandinavia or they came from, from uh, other countries in Europe, uh, in Eastern Europe or in uh, countries like Italy or the Middle East or uh, any other countries out there in the world, you can be almost, a, well, you are 100% assured that there are at least some, mem some people in that country that, are, that have their family tree here on, uh, on my heritage. And in some countries of Europe, there are millions of, of family of my heritage users in each of those countries. The chances of you connecting with a relative in one of those countries is extremely high. And this is the this is kind of the key that drives this this, this huge company. And uh, you, I also might mention that this country is headquartered in Israel, and it is and its offices are right outside of Tel Aviv, Israel. And so it's, uh, they're very European oriented. And this is an advantage. Uh, obviously, if you have ancestors here in the United States, you're still going to get a benefit because of all the people here in the, in the United States that also are on this record. The actual number of records today is um, 17,998,458,744. And they're adding over 10 billion new records in one year. Now, a month ago, I put together the framework of this, uh, of this presentation. And during that one month, there have been over a billion records added. And I just updated this slide just a few minutes before uh, this presentation, because otherwise it's always wrong. So I uh, try to do that to keep up to it. So let's look at what's kind of newer on my heritage and the things that uh, you can benefit from. And it won't be covering some of the basic issues of the pro, I mean, some of the basic features of the program and some of the things that you can do with a family tree on my heritage. And we have a number of other um, videos uh, that I've done previously and that other people have done uh, that are in the BYU Family History Library YouTube channel that you can um, return refer to for more basic instruction on how the pro how the program operates. In addition, um, MyHeritage has its own education website. It's called education.myheritage.com. And uh, you can go to education, spelled out, dot myheritage.com and have access to a lot of, uh, of instructional materials that get into the real details of how the program works and how to uh, how to function and and utilize all of these different features. Today, this presentation will talk primarily just about um, the the newer features of the program and some things that you can benefit from. Uh, one thing that's important to understand uh, when you start comparing these various programs is that all the records on my heritage all 17 billion plus of records are completely indexed and completely searchable so when you realize that the a large percentage is a uh, percentage of the records on on family search are not indexed um, then you begin to see that even though family search has billions of records that the accessibility of those records is far different than it is on my heritage 
And the, the advantage of the program is through a process they call record matches. And record matches get, tell what they do is take every person in your family tree and do a very sophisticated search on all the records on the whole program. And then they constantly supply you with the record matches. And the record matches are extremely accurate. It depending on the time frame. Uh, obviously, with genealogy, the further back you go in time, the fewer records there are, and the more possible names are, are have people with the same names. And so, uh, if you're starting to think, well, I can go back in 1600s and see what I can find, well, that's not going to work in any program anywhere. But for people living in the last 200 years, the accuracy of the records hints is is impressive and uh, it it comes almost up to the level of 98 percent accuracy i find them to be extremely accurate the problem of course with all genealogical research in all times is people with the same name and common names so if you're looking for someone named john brown in english you probably aren't or jose garcia in Spanish, you probably are going to not, uh, it's not going to be as accurate as you would wish, but it may find the records, even though it may also find other records that are too similar to differentiate. So the real issue here is um, how to get into the historical records. And so there is a way to search records on my heritage. But I would put this into the category of being uh, sort of ignoring the whole purpose of the program. Uh, in in the in the case in this case in this uh, particular situation, I have tens of thousands of record matches waiting for me on my heritage. Uh, the number of of records they're able to find is, uh, in a lot of cases, not always, depending on where your person, your ancestors and relatives lived. But in a lot of cases, you're going to be having more records uh, presented to you than you can uh, even spend time processing. And that, that is something that you have to kind of experience. Now, many people, when they start out on my heritage, uh, when I've said something like that, that they provide a lot of these record hints, they don't understand that you need to prime the pump. You have to put in enough information so that they can begin finding your people and your patterns. Um, and it, it may work from just your name, the name of your parents and your grandparents and something a little bit about them, like their birth places and birth dates. But on other cases, uh, you may need to go further back on your family tree and put in some information that you already know uh, before it actually begins to, to find your people. But when it does, then it can, then you it builds. And uh, as more you work with the program, the more record hints and record matches that you will you will have. And even even if you find no records on the program, it's very possible that you will find record matches with people who are uh, who share your your ancestry, who are your relatives. And this is enhanced by taking a DNA test with uh, MyHeritage or uploading the, re the results from other DNA tests to MyHeritage. And then as they increase that, that searching possibility, then they will, will have more and more information for you and, and uh, provide a lot more connections. And when you get a connection, for example, if I have tens of thousands of relatives who show up on all of these programs uh, and uh, it, it's overwhelming. I don't. I don't really, unless I have a specific question. I don't. I don't really have any any uh, incentive to go out there and try and organize and talk to all these tens of thousands of people. But on the other hand, if you're if you come from a place where records are very scarce, like Eastern Europe um, or other places like that, and you find a relative on my heritage, they will show you how you're related. And then if you talk, you can talk to that person directly and they're there in the, in the country, they are, they speak the language, they understand the records 
and you may find uh, that they are extremely helpful. And uh, in my some of my experience with the program, I've had many of my friends who have worked with this program over the years have developed friendships with and uh, with their relatives in uh, Europe and have actually spent time going to Europe and visiting and, and meeting with the people and had some wonderful experiences and able to find a, a lot of information that they could not otherwise find simply by it's a catalyst that it, it helps to for these kinds of relationships to develop. Okay, so one of the things about uh, my heritage that uh, happened just quite recently uh, was back uh, in August, almost a year ago now. Uh, my heritage bought a French company called Filet. And they, uh, in, in results of this purchase, they have incorporated the, the records from uh, the French records held by Filet and, and then acquired uh, considerably more records that we'll look at. And so what's happened now is that we have, uh, when you have a subscription to MyHeritage, you immediately have access, if you have a full subscription with the data subscription, uh, then you will have access to all these records, all these millions of records, completely indexed and searchable. And so you, it will open up a tremendous amount of uh, opportunity for doing research in France from that has not previously been generally available. Um, not that Filet did not have a lot of these records, but that they were, it was relatively unknown and did not have the um, the structure that is here on my heritage. So if we look at Europe um, and European re and countries, we will we'll find that there are uh, 1100 plus collections of records from Europe with over 3.4 billion European records. That's from all of the countries of Europe. Uh, obviously they have <clears throat> more records in some countries than they have in others. And it's, um, uh, it's something you can learn very quickly because you can go to what they call the collection catalog and uh, see whether they, what records they have for every country in the world. And so, but they are focused on uh, Europe and uh, we understand from, there's no real way to compare it, but from the feedback that uh, we've received that I've received, uh, they have probably the best and most extensive collection of German records that are that are presently completely searchable and available online. So this is the collections that they got from France. They have 99 collections with 1.2 billion records from France. Now, understand when I talk about new that they have received all of these records and implemented them and, and, and uh, indexed them and had them made available on their website in the last year. So it's just this last year that they've added this particular collection of French records. And it's extremely extensive. And if you have French ancestry, they will immediately begin sending you a record hints, as a record hints, um, record matches, excuse me, for each of the people you have in your French uh, family history. And uh, to expand that, um, they have a collection of uh, 29 collections with 107 million records in Denmark. Now, Denmark's not a huge country, and the number of records they have is, is complete, it's very extensive. Uh, I'll mention, I may mention this again, but they have all of the uh, Danish censuses completely searchable and completely part of the record match pro uh, program and will match those to the, your ancestors uh, in a very sophisticated way, going back to every census record back to the 1600s. And they have the uh, these millions and millions of other records of Denmark. And how did they get these? Well, basically they made an agreement with the country of Denmark to, to incorporate uh, the digital images and index all of the records that they had available of civil registration and uh, church records and uh, census records and other uh, the tax records and other records from Denmark. Uh, likewise, 
they have 12 collections with 82 million records in Norway. Uh, Norwegian records have always been online, uh, well, for a long time have been online and uh, available uh, for free from, uh, from Norway. But this, the advantage here with uh, my heritage is that not only are all the, all the collections uh, indexed and searchable, uh, all these 82 million plus records, but they provide you record matches with, with all of these records. So they'll go tell you this, these are the people that you're related to. And of course, in, in Scandinavian countries, that can be pretty tricky, especially with patronymics. And so uh, you need to be careful of their matches like you would with any, any matches. But again, I have personally watched people build uh, their pedigree in a matter of a few, uh, of, of just less than an hour begin collect, been building records back on their pedigree with, with a almost flawless accuracy. That takes some sophistication on your part, on the, on the researcher's part, because you have to be able to understand and read and, and uh, still match the records properly. But they are found and they are localized by, by the location of the records. And then there are 34 collections presently with 189 million records in Sweden. Uh, anybody who does rich, uh, research in Sweden should probably understand that um, they use the uh, the uh, Swedish record set of records called um, oh that's going to go into my out of my head but uh, the digital archives of of Sweden uh, which is by the way a for for um, a paying for a paywall collection of records a lot of those records were moved also over to ancestry but now my heritage has incorporated those records and uh, and indexed and has the entire collection and eventually they're just still being added but they will eventually have all the swedish records that are available and have been digitized um if we go into one of the areas that uh, that sometimes gets a little frustrating for people uh, who are doing genealogy, and one of those things is that uh, newspaper collections are usually uh, behind a paywall. They're usually uh, subscription services, and they're usually not uh, combined with the subscription that you get uh, from the from a big website. Here with uh, my heritage, they have incorporated all of their newspaper collections and they have 1.2 billion re newspaper records from around the world. Um, the newspaper collections are particularly difficult um, to, to search because uh, I'm going to have to, it's opinion, but search engines on the various uh, newspaper websites out there uh, vary greatly in their ability to find the records. Uh, the advantage of, of having them on my heritage is that they do all that searching for you at a very high degree of accuracy. And one of the record sets that they that they search is the Chronicling America Historical Rec America Newspapers, which is the Library of Congress website. Now, it, those records are free on, from the Library of Congress, but uh, the search engine is very difficult to use, and you have to be able uh, have quite get some appreciable familiarity with the program before it can be uh, very productive. But here you have uh, my heritage finding newspapers um, for your family as quickly or faster than you could possibly ever incorporate them. Um, it, you know, you can, it, there's always, when there's always seems to be a uh, someone who comes and says, well, I don't ever get any newspaper collection thing. Well, part of that problem is usually traced back to the amount of information that you incorporate, how much work you've done on the program, and how many other sources you've added. The programs that on all the computer programs that have or websites that work with genealogical records, generally speaking, they do a better job of finding your people if you, you let them do their job and incorporate all of the 
record hints and record matches that they provide to you. If you do your work in taking advantage of the information, um, as many times, for instance, I'll go on to either my heritage or ancestry or family search, and I'll see literally hundreds, if not thousands, of uh, indications that there are records waiting for someone uh, to incorporate. And they haven't done that, even gone through the, that simple. Uh, I often, it's not infrequent that I'm, when I'm online consulting with people through the Family History Library in Salt Lake City, that uh, someone will ask me a question and I'll pull up their, their person in, say, Family Search and find out that their record match is right there waiting to be incorporated that answer the question that they're coming in to, to consult about. So uh, part of this whole process of working with these large websites like MyHeritage is to take advantage of those records that are there um, and, and work with them. Now, it could be overwhelming. And the answer is, well, how overwhelming can I get? What can I do with all this? And how what I always suggest when you're working with these larger websites is to, to have specific research goals with specific families and specific individuals. And if they have the records, use them. If they don't have the records, then ignore what's out there and all the other stuff. Be focused on your goals and your families and not driven by green leaves and record matches, and record hints from all these different programs. Okay, now one of the things that's been or incorporated just very recently is what's called a timeline view. Now you're, you probably are, are familiar with a timeline showing uh, events that happened in your ancestors' lives uh, or uh, ways that, uh, that you know, they say, okay, well, you're, this thing was invented when, you, when your ancestor was alive, things like that and also a, chrono a chronological order. In other words, they're showing you on, uh, on a timeline, they're saying, well, this child was born, then this child was born, and then this happened, and then this happened, and so forth. Well, what has happened here in the timeline view on my heritage is they've carried that uh, much further. They've turned it into a tool which tells you rather quickly about each family, the history of each family. So you're looking here at uh, some of the families here, and you can see the timeline across the top of the screen. And what you're looking at is all the members of the family in a, in a contrasting color. So you have uh, a, the ancestral family here, and the person that it's starting with is um, over on the right-hand side. That happens to be my grandfather. And then my, uh, uh, you have his parents, and then her, my, in this case, showing his mother, and then his, um, then you have, you go back on each line. Now, why is this is kind of innovative? Because it shows you almost instantly whether or not someone does not fit in the family. So if you have uh, the name of a person and you put them in a certain family and you bring this up, it will be a, a fairly obvious that that person does not fit in the family. And it's, it's an interesting thing to work with and, uh, and to, to uh, see what kinds of things that happen here when you, when you look at this time. This, um, anim it's not animated, but this illustrated uh, timeline. One of the things that you can get in, in a lot of the um, websites and some websites uh, online is say, how am I related to this person? Now, when you're doing research and you start to move back in your family line, and then you start doing research on children and on the grandchildren, which is called descendancy research, it's really kind of, it, you can really kind of get lost because you find somebody and then you'll find a child or you'll find uh, some other relationship. And all of a sudden you can't remember who, how you're related to this person or if you're related to this person. Well, 
there are, there are lots of different ways of showing that relationship. But what this shows uh, in a relationship, uh, it shows more uh, that more than uh, just how you're related to any specific individual. It shows how those individuals are related. So in other words, I'm looking here at, at my grandfather again and his father. And then I have um, how is Roy Parkinson Tanner related to Charles Godfrey de Vries Jarvis. So the two, so we can see how Henry Martin Tanner and Charles Godfrey de Vries Jarvis are, um, are related and the lines that connect them. Uh, this is a little bit different than simply showing your direct line ancestors back and the people you, you have on your ancestral and your ancestral line. So uh, this will give you a way to navigate and and show uh, how your family and a lot of times interrelated especially if uh, your family members happen to mar marry cousins and then that becomes something that shows up uh, in a in a, this kind of a of a relationship so this is the new uh, newer um, my heritage family tree view uh, they pack a lot of information into the family tree, but the information is um, not at the, the top level. In other words, when you're looking at the picture, it's it's of the family tree, the pedigree here uh, view. You have uh, other views. Uh, you can do uh, a more picturesque view, uh, which is a more vertical view, and also fan chart up to 10 generation fan chart. But uh, this tree view uh, gives you quickly some uh, all of the relationships and to the to basic back to the different ends of lines that uh, that are on your family tree. The little dots are what are important, and they are the green dots are what are this called your smart matches. Those are the matches off to other people who share your family tree, and you can see that. Uh, nearly everybody on this particular part of the family tree. Uh, I have other MyHeritage users who, who, are, who show that same person as a relative, and uh, in some cases, many such. All the brown dots that are there, the darker colored dots, are record matches, meaning there are records there waiting to be attached to all of these individuals. And uh, then I have to go back and, re and uh, kind of repeat what I said earlier about focusing on what you need to do. Uh, there are literally thousands of record matches and record hints on, and on all these programs uh, for people who are in my family trees. Um, but uh, I, and I, let's call it harvest them uh, on occasion when I have a, a need to, to find additional information about a particular person. But my focus is, and is on the people that I am interested in researching. The, the issue here with this particular set of records is that they are, uh, to a large extent, the, the records that I originally uh, developed and researched over 40 years ago. And uh, with a lot of a lot of other of my relatives who have been involved. And so uh, the interest that we have in these is more in adding incremental information about each of the families. Now, my other grandfather here, uh, Harold Morgan, who's this, uh, who's over on the left-hand side is this chart. Uh, it's been interesting for him because with my heritage, I've been able to find uh, a fairly large number of newspaper articles because he was a newspaper man. He worked with uh, in newspapers as an editor and, and reporter for for many most of his life, and so his newspaper presence is quite large. And uh, he, in fact, owned a newspaper for a while. And those all of those seem to are now being discovered by my heritage, and so I've used that to find a, a considerably large number, and I don't seem to be able to ever catch up. <clears throat> so no matter how many records. <clears throat> excuse me, how many records I've added for Harold Morgan, it seems like they always find more. 
So it is, uh, it's kind of an un un unending process. Some people would say, well, I'd really like to have that because I don't, uh, but uh, uh, it's, you, you will, uh, you know, you're really selling yourself short if you, if you are not taking advantage of uh, these, the other larger websites, because uh, they will find different records for each one of them. Each one of them will find records that you will not find on any other website. I can tell you right now, you will not find the newspaper records found by my heritage on any other website, automatically found. Okay. And that's uh, a sort of a blow up of one of the one of the people there so you can see that a little bit closer and the, the two different icons on here now if i add a dna match to any of these people through other people directly then uh there would be another little icon there that would show me that there was a dna match to a person or that they had recon had constructed uh, a relationship for that person to me now, this is called the profile view, and uh, that's for that person, Gerard Morgan, that I had chosen earlier. And uh, this is where the information comes up. Now, here you're seeing they found four records so, uh, so far for this person who was born back in 18, this is one of my direct line grandfathers, and uh, was born in, back in 1806. They have four records. Two of those records are in family trees. Uh, three actually are in family trees, and one is an 1850 United States federal census record. Um, it would be very good if I were doing specific research on this person. I would come in here and add all those records in so that I would have additional information about this individual. Um, but the one thing that's kind of important about this is that uh, up in there in the right-hand corner, and I've blown that up so you can see. There are four record matches, but there are 17 smart matches. That means if I were interested in finding out more information that other people had, then I would have the potential of contacting at least 17 other people about this one person. It also is telling me I have a consistency issue. That means there's something on this uh, particular person that needs to be corrected. And then there's also a way to click and say, research this person, which will then trigger a, a search through all the records on my heritage um, in, in case I have added more information or if I'm looking for a specific type of record and I haven't been able to find that previously. Okay, one of the other parts of my heritage that is um, tremendously useful is uh, the media. And uh, the numbers here, once again, uh, I'm, I'm at the, I'm kind of one of the outliers of the people who have uh, tens of thousands of relatives. If you're at the other end of the spectrum, uh, you may be surprised to find one uh, photograph. But let me let me kind of relate a story that happened uh, this past year uh, with uh, that was directly related to my heritage. I was contacted by uh, a patron for the library uh, who wanted some information. Uh, he had uh, his parents. One of his his father was uh, from Spain, and his mother was from Russia, actually in the Ukraine. And um, so he knew, he said he had already done all the research back that he could find on, on Spain. And he had done a very, uh, very, sim very professional level job. And he was a very sophisticated uh, genealogical researcher, but he had no concept of what to do to find any relatives in Russia. And he did not speak Russian, and although he did speak Spanish. And so that was, um, uh, that was the, the issue that had occurred. Well, he began, I said, well, if you want people from Russia, you've got to get on my heritage. And so he got on my heritage and he did a DNA test and he um, uh, immediately began to get contacts and found a, uh, a relative who uh, in the eastern part of the United States, and he lived in the western part, 
who uh, had a number of photographs of his family. And not only that, she had a lot more information about the individuals and identifying the individuals. And let's just say after, a, after being on my heritage for a matter of a few weeks, he had already obtained a, a, a number of relatives, photographs of his relatives, a very large number, and had contacted over 400 people who he was related to and came up as DNA matches and found that part of his family has, held, has lived in Canada and was holding family reunions uh, for a large number of relatives. In a matter of just a few uh, weeks and uh, months, he had gone from not knowing anything about his family to having uh, uh, contact with people all around the world that he was related to directly. So this is uh, this. It's it's an amazing process that you go through when you begin to to work with these programs. They're not. It's a lot more sophisticated and a lot more um, uh, directed towards connecting with people than uh, than any of the other programs. My Heritage is the one that connects you fastest and to other people. Um, Now we get into the kind of the razzle dazzle, the kinds of things that are are tremendously um, impressive. This is my gr my grandmother, who I never knew. She died long before I was born. Uh, she actually died when my father was eight was eight years old um, from uh, diabetes. Um, but she, um, but we're going to focus on her photograph here. Now. One thing you can do, uh, and depending on which program they're offering at the time, you can upload a photo to MyHeritage and go through this process uh, with kind of just a registration with the program. And it's no, there's no charge to go through it. Uh, but under some, whenever it's not in a promotional program, you may have to have um, a, an actual purchased or registered uh, subscription to the program. But in this case, this was the original photograph that I had for uh, one of many hundreds. Uh, this, my great grandmother, um, Eva Margaret Overson's mother was a professional photographer and uh, I inherited over uh, 4,000 of her photos. So this is one of the 4,000 plus photos and uh, you can see it's uh, it was a it's a glass plate, meaning it's uh, from the 1800s, and it has uh, pretty significant damage. And the parts in black around the edge are where the the um, media from the photograph, the coating on the photograph on the glass plate has has uh, flaked off or deteriorated, cannot be restored. But there's some other kinds of things that are there that are. Uh, not quite as as good as you'd like them. So you'll see up at the top, you'll see that there are some bu buttons. Once I've uploaded this, I have these buttons. If the photo is damaged, you'll have a repair button, an enhance button, a colorize button, and an uh, animate button. And then uh, you'll also have uh, another uh, 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 op option that's called live story. So let's see what happens when you get involved with these photos. On the left hand side, your original. And uh, on the right, uh, then uh, we've done some uh, repair. And this is just about a, a maybe 15, 20, 20, 15 second process, uh, or maybe a, a slightly longer. And now, if you're not, um, as I have mentioned at the beginning, if you're not a professional photographer, you may not be kind of aware of what's happened here. But what's happened here is that a lot of what we call artifacts have been removed from this photo. The black parts are irreparable. There's no way to, to um, actually repair those. You could cover them up or you could uh, uh, change those if you put it into a sophisticated program like Adobe Photoshop or Lightroom or Adobe Lightroom. Uh, you could make some repairs, further repairs, but they would not be the original photograph. They would be things that were added to this original photograph. Whereas this is essentially 
eliminating things that were probably may have been in the originals because the the glass plate was not completely clean or because other things happened. And most of those show up as the, the kind of lighter white dots that are on the uh, left-hand side on the original. Okay, but then we're gonna take this one more step and we're going to go from repair to repaired and enhanced. And now if you look at the detail on the face of this, uh, my grandmother here, you'll see what we mean by enhanced and repaired. And the detail that comes into the hair, for example. Um, once you see that, then you see what can be done with other photographs that maybe aren't didn't start out as good as this one did, which is was an extremely good photograph to begin with. But now we have a, a better photograph with a more detail in the face. And now we can go to the third step, which is you can colorize that photo. So there you can see the photo that would look like if she was in color, if the photo were in color. Now the question always comes up, well, what color was her hair originally? Um, this makes a pretty good guess. Uh, and from the, the type, uh, the color, the way it's the light hits it, it was probably a lighter color uh, of, uh, of brown. It may not have been red, as red as this, but it's, uh, this is a fair approximation. Now, unfortunately, we don't have any color photographs of, uh, of my, my grandmother, but this you can see is a, makes a striking difference in, in the, and being able to see her and, it, uh, and the way that she may have looked at the time. Now, we can go into something that gets a little bit spooky, and that is uh, we can animate that photograph. So now we can choose uh, a whole different types of animation. So there's, in this case, already there's 10, plus there, there's uh, other special animations that, uh, that you can choose and play around with. So let's go ahead and see it. This is what happens when we do the animation. Okay. Now, that's, that's amazing in itself, but we can also go to what's called deep story. And deep story, I may have said live story before, but I'm, this is called deep story. And this is deep story. This is the this is also a photograph of my grandmother that's been um, in, let's call it improved. Uh, it's been repaired and everything. So let's listen to this. Hi, I'm Eva Margaret Overson. Here is what I would like now, you to can remember you hear about me. I yes. was born on August 14, okay. 1897, in St. John's. My father, Henry Christian Overson, was born in 1868 in USA. My mother, Margaret Godfrey Jarvis, was born in 1878 in USA. When they married in 1896, my mother was 11 years younger than my father. I had eight brothers, Henry, Al... Okay, well, this can go on for as long as you want it to. And each of these deep stories can be customized. So you could rewrite, you can rewrite the script and add all the photos and upload it. And then you have this animated version. You designate the photo that you want to be the animation. And then you can add in your own photos, collect selection like I did here. And uh, if you want to spend some time, you can rewrite the script and have more detail or tell stories or whatever you want to do. It is a, a very um, impressive, and very interesting kind of technology. And all this is included in what you get when you are a subscriber to, a full subscriber to my heritage. Okay, let's go up, oh, we're in the right place, there we go. Okay, now we're gonna switch over in the last few minutes here to uh, just a little bit about the DNA. Uh, DNA testing has become a tremendously important tool to all sorts of um, people around the world. 
uh, in finding their families and discovering uh, their ancestry. Uh, one of the things you get when you take a DNA test is called an ethnicity estimate. And it's really an estimate and it's been changing over time and evolving. Uh, this one uh, from my heritage is fairly sophisticated and is generally uh, the same as other DNA company tests uh, like to ancestry that I've taken. And so it is, uh, uh, you know, it, it's an indication of where my family, my family came from. Uh, it, over, the, over the years that I've had the DNA tests and over the, the time period, so it's become a lot more focused and a lot more specific. But what's really happened in the case is that my heritage has developed some very sophisticated tools that allow, that allow you to um, uh, focus in on uh, the, your DNA samples in a way that you, it probably takes it well beyond the, uh, the range of just being a kind of educational or, uh, ed or entertainment. The Chromosome browser uh, is a way that's, it's a tool that, that organizes the uh, results of your DNA test and lets you uh, find specific detail of matches with all of the other people out there that turn out to be, uh, that have the same ethnicity. Auto clusters do does the same thing in matching you to a cluster of people who share your uh, your particular DNA um, amount of the information that's in your DNA. So when you do that, you actually see by a square that creates a square cluster of all the people who have DNA matches, and you can see exactly how you are all interrelated. And that helps you to focus on, on creating uh, common ancestry and also determine your actual uh, relationship to these people. And one of the things that you'll find, which is fairly common now in DNA, is you may find ancestors or relatives that you did not know you had or were new to you. Uh, you can, may find out you're not related to your parents or to your grandparents or someone that you thought you've been related to all your life. Uh, that's kind of the uh, interesting and uh, fairly emotional end of, of the program. The other one is your ethnicities. And that, instead of just showing you where your ethnicities, it actually shows you um, what are the most common ethnicities in each country and the top ones for each country. So you can begin to, to understand what kind of background you might have in those countries. So here's a, an idea of what kinds of ethnicities there are in all these different countries. And so they're beginning to develop uh, by the DNA tests, uh, how all these people are interrelated and where the uh, actual physical relationships came from. Now here's a new, new uh, changing fields because we could go on for you know a tremendous long time. But here's a... Um, a function that happened just in the last few in the last month or so, and that is um, the the U.S. 1950 U.S. Census. Well, my heritage has already got gotten that uh, searchable, but it's not only searchable; it's automatically searchable, and you can. It's called the Census Helper, and when you put your family tree in, the program begins looking. Uh, through everyone you have in your family tree and matching them up to their census records. So rather than the very uh, tedious process that I went through years ago in looking through one family's uh, census, every record census record for one family, which turned out to be from early 1800s, so the 1810, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, uh, 60, 80, you know, 70, 80, and 1900, 1910, and 20, and 30, and 40 censuses for every member of a huge family. And that was very tedious. This does that completely. Bing, they give you uh, four. In this one, the number was 418 people were, who were in the 1950 census from my family tree. But that number was, I didn't wait for all of the searches. Now, in addition to that, they'll list all your people in, all, in the England and Wales censuses 
the Canadian censuses, the Ireland censuses, the Scotland censuses, all the Denmark censuses, the Norway censuses from 1910 to 1801, and the French censuses from 1906, 1901, and 1872. So you sit there and wait for a while, and then you have a complete search of every one of those census for, censuses for everyone in your family. How much time do you think that will save you? They also have uh, some very interesting statistical information about your people. So I have 4,300 plus people in my, my heritage family tree. And that's just a selection of the people that I've done research of. Um, and I'm adding to that number uh, constantly on, on my heritage. But automatically, for example, I have uh, more thousands of names on uh, family search, but uh, a lot of those are questionable because the, there are no, no substantiation. So this is the kind of a core of people that I'm absolutely uh, have substantiated and supported. So there, there's no question that I'm related to all these people. So they're going to show you common last names, common first names, how many people were living, um, and how, as compared to how many people were deceased in your family tree. Um, so do you know how many living people you've entered, uh, what gender, gender percentages there are, uh, relationship status, uh, how, there, how many were single, how many were married, divorced, and widowed, um, and all sorts of other information. Uh, then if you go through it further, it will show you all your family statistics. So by places you get into uh, which, how many numbers came from each of the different countries of the world and how many people in your family tree are uh, in those different areas. And then where the people died. And uh, so basically these are all the categories, the places, the ages, the births, the marriages, the children and the divorces. And then when you get in here, you get into things like age distribution of when the people died and the oldest and youngest and life expectancy. There's just a lot of very interesting things that you're gonna find as you get into the program. Um, then some of this is, is, is more interesting than, uh, than just giving you just something, well, that's interesting because it can tell you a lot of things about your family. And uh, some of this can be extrapolated into what, how your family is, is constructed today and how many, how much the frequency and how many problems that your family or challenges they've had in the past. Okay, well, thanks for watching. Um, and uh, we'll hope that you have a little bit better view of what uh, is going on presently. Now, the only thing I re can really say at this point is it will change. My heritage will change next week, this week, next week, next month, and next year. And you'll have millions, if not billions, of more records. And you'll have millions and millions of more people. Thanks for watching. Thank you so much for joining us today. We hope you will join us for our next webinar, which is on Thursday, June 9th with Julie Stoddard. She will be giving a presentation entitled, Understanding DNA and Using DNA Test Results to Build Your Family Tree. A recording of this webinar will be made available next week. You can view that on our YouTube channel or on our website. If you have any comments or questions, you can always email us at fhl underscore webinars at byu.edu or follow Facebook and Twitter. Thank you and have a wonderful week.